My main message for many of the entrepreneurs would be that don't sell off your business too early. Today in our Makers and Shapers series, we have Martin Willig. Martin, we are extremely happy to have you with us today. Martin is the co-founder of Bolt, and he will explain to us where Bolt is about, and we will discuss jointly the challenges of building unicorns in Europe. Hello, uh, greetings from Tallinn, Estonia. Yes, um, I have been an entrepreneur for about 20 years, and we founded Bolt uh, together with my brother uh, in 2013. So it's now uh, eight years we have been in business. Bolt is a super app based in Europe uh, with 75 million customers in 45 markets, and that's in, in Europe and Africa. And uh, we offer a range of mobility-related uh, products uh, for different services and needs. So starting from a ride-hailing or taxi service, that was the core where we started. Now we uh, offer also electric scooters and e-bikes uh, for rentals in the cities. Uh, then it's Bolt Food, delivering ready-made uh, meals from the restaurants. Uh, Bolt Market is a new service, 15-minute uh, grocery delivery service that's in piloting phase. And the recent product is then Bolt Drive. Uh, it's a car rental service uh, and, and also in a piloting phase that we plan to expand soon. We try to offer the whole package for, for urban citizens to solve transportation more responsibly and, and, uh, and when exactly they need it. Excellent story, uh, Martin. Uh, of course, when we talk about unicorns, people somehow have a first reflex. Oh, that's what you do in Silicon Valley and not in Europe because it's difficult, it's fragmented, you can't get the money and what have you. Uh, Estonia, I think, shows that you can do it in Europe. From a relatively small country, you see a high number of unicorns emerging and you're one of them. What are the core ingredients for building a unicorn? Um, of course, we can, we can talk from our perspective that is growing out of Estonia and then expanding to Europe and Africa. But uh, what we see is that Estonia has a really great uh, ecosystem for digital innovation. So we have startup visa or a residency and, and different other things. So the country has developed its... Uh, uh, it's digital services for last uh, 15 years already. Also a small ecosystem where founders are supporting each other. We have now growing number of uh, capital that has been developed over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the angels networks, uh, local investors and so on. Uh, I would also say that it's, it's a mix of technical uh, talent and uh, also a small local market. So we have just 1.3 million people. So you can't build a big business here. You have to think globally from day one. So Skype has been a big influencer for Estonian ecosystem starting from 2003 and on peak times hiring 700, 800 of the top talent in the country. So people got really good experience of how to build global products. They also got uh, some funding for themselves, either to start their own startups or invest back to the other founders. Overall, I think it's, uh, it's really important to have this kind of good, good role models, great local uh, startups and, and very lively ecosystems supporting each other and everyone going global. So that's how Estonia has been able to really uh, grow so many unicorns. If you look at Uber that is operating from an American market, you are operating from a European market as a starting point. What are the main differences and how do you compete? Everyone assumes that Silicon Valley is the place to build great startups, and, and I think it is. But I think there are also other regions globally that uh, are now really aspiring and, and, uh, and fast growing and, and really proving that, that it's possible to really compete with uh, US and Chinese uh, big, uh, big tech companies. I think that by doing things more efficiently, we can pass on those savings to our customers and partners. We really want to be more driver focused and also responsible companies. So coming from a small market, we understand the localization needs. We also are responsible for the climate. We understand that 20% of CO2 emissions comes from transport. So we need to be uh, really responsible. So we currently 
offer carbon neutral rights already for two years. You need investors. So in your specific case of uh, Bolt, uh, you mentioned already you have angels that were uh, successful themselves and are reinvesting into the local ecosystem. Did you also call on investors from outside the Estonian ecosystem? And if so, how did you attract them to invest in Estonia and in your company? let's say 10 years ago, seven years ago, the amount of capital was still much more limited and uh, foreign investors were not that willing also to invest into Eastern Europe. So so we have seen that that many startups actually flip their headquarters to, uh, to US or, or to UK. But now uh, Bolt has proven that it's also possible to raise hundreds of millions uh, of euros into Estonian uh, entity and then we see more and more uh, founders actually keeping their their headquarters in the in the local uh, markets and then uh, due to let's say difficulties in in raising a huge amount of uh, funding early years that actually has uh, designed or, or forced our company DNA to be very frugal and we see that now that has become a, a big strength uh, compared to the U.S. counterparts or friends who have usually billions of dollars. And that brings me to another topic, and that's the role of governments. The governments also build the regulations, and sometimes the regulations are at odds with the objectives of new entrants. Can you reflect a bit on what Estonia was able to do? You're operating in a global market. How is your relationship with governments? It's always good to build a business in, in an environment where you have clear regulation, but uh, often when you need to innovate, sometimes you need to go a bit ahead of the regulation. The taxi regulation was created in the 70s. These kind of apps and platforms were not possible as, as we have today. Estonia was one of the first countries that came up with a very dynamic uh, new taxi regulation that combined traditional taxis and, uh, and the ride-hailing taxis. We are pro-regulation, but it should be reasonable and proportionate to uh, support the growth and, and innovation in Europe. And we see that Europe would actually need harmonized ride-hailing regulation. The other side of government intervention is, of course, funding. Funding early stage startups, also putting money on the table to scale them up. What's your opinion about this? There is quite a lot of uh, funding available for, from seed stage to, to growth. But if we look at more deep tech or, or, or ideas growing out from scientists and universities, uh, I think that government I intervention or, or help in that sector to really get off the ground is, is needed. There are more risky ones. They are taking longer to really get to the market. We need some grants to really activate the scientists to commercialize their great ideas. But as early as possible, we should also try to start doing co-investing so that, uh, that uh, there would be validation of private investors so that uh, we wouldn't fund some projects too long from the government. And then we end up uh, finding out that, OK, there is actually no, no, no market uh, need. It's tricky to get it to the right balance. That also brings us to the role of the universities, because deep tech is a very often technology founded in scientific research. What's your message to the European universities? I think it's a challenge for both sides, how universities should review their actual terms, how uh, the scientists could turn these ideas into companies. What are the expectations for future investors? What kind of rights and privileges they should have in, have in the in the ownership structure. I know that uh, some top universities globally, uh, mainly from US, have it very well established and it's easy and, and smooth process to really commercialize. So I think we have some things to learn from there. Uh, but on the other side, uh, definitely uh, the entrepreneur should also look more for, for uh, the cooperation with universities. So does the European university system deliver the right talent in general european universities are are growing going in the right direction but uh, i think it's it's still a big debate in the uh, in the society overall in estonia we try to really encourage people to during uh, the school time visit uh, 20 30 40 different organization types and understand what kind of work is done everywhere and what are the critical issues and what kind of skills are needed here again entrepreneurs can come to help to work with universities i'm also uh, involved in the estonian education uh, foundation which is really trying to um, to uh, develop and then fund these kind of initiatives there is also some debate going on said that 
the generic university should really deliver uh, well-educated people with a broad perspective and be really talents to society at large, while the applied universities are maybe more specific job-oriented uh, education uh, programs. I'm not sure we, we see so big difference. If we look at from the company and hiring perspective, then, uh, yeah, we, we value really the, the skills uh, or, or, let's say, the mindset uh, and the values of people much more than actually the, the uh, truly only academic uh, kind of diploma. We often see that uh, some people with internal drive, they can go through even a shorter let's say a six month bootcamp program and then uh, learn early things of coding and uh, and then be be much more let's say hungry to grow and build something great so so i think that we we look at all sides of the of the talents and candidates when we hire them the diploma itself does not guarantee you a very good work uh, place or, or job opportunities, your internal drive as well is, is very important, for at least for a company like Bolt. The challenge is to make sure that talent remains in Europe and helps to build our digital industry. That requires good jobs, a flourishing ecosystem, good industry. And that brings me actually to the investment. Are European investors eager enough, risk-taking enough? And then I'm talking about mergers and acquisitions, corporate investment arms. Is Europe entrepreneurial enough? It's very difficult to generalize. Some funds have a certain expiration dates that they need to work on. But on the other side, corporate uh, VC arms probably can be into the business's longer term and, and really uh, help to grow uh, the businesses. Then maybe my main message for many of the entrepreneurs would be that don't sell off your business too early. That's what Bolt is also trying to prove is you can actually compete if you are smart, if you are frugal, if you have a great mission, then uh, you can find the talent to grow. Just a, a final question. In which domain do you expect the new European unicorns. It will be definitely a combination of technology and real world. It would be wider definition of deep tech, biotechnology or, or climate related uh, activities, autonomous and, and robotics technologies. There are still a lot of opportunities to how to make overall the uh, transportation and, and logistics, bio and agriculture as well. So that uh, the growing population we have on the planet, everyone wants to have healthy food, the regular software business is, is getting more saturated, but there is an enormous amount of opportunities when you mix technology and the actual uh, deep uh, operations on the ground. Martin, it was really a pleasure to have you with us today. I really enjoyed your knowledge, the story of uh, Bolt and the messages you give to young entrepreneurs on how to build their companies in Europe. Martin, thank you very much for being with us today on our Makers and Shapers series. Thank you and let's bring great companies out of Europe.